This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by the iPrize and the Energy Innovation Hub. The iPrize is an international startup competition to build the machine economy. Go to epicenter.tv slash iPrize, that's I-P-R-I-Z-E, to learn how to join the competition. Hello and welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we, we are going to talk on a very interesting niche but potentially very powerful topic in, in cryptocurrencies. We are going to talk about cryptocurrencies that don't have a blockchain as the fundamental data structure. It has like something else. So we are going to talk about a protocol called Spectre which was developed by Dr. Aviv Zohar and Yonatan Sompolinsky. Both of them are at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Aviv is uh, an assistant professor there and Yonatan is a PhD student there. So let's get started. Aviv and Yonatan, uh, thank you for coming on the show. Hi, thank you for having us. Yes, it's an honor. So, te- so tell us about a bit about your background. How did you get started in the field of uh, cryptocurrencies, starting with Aviv? Okay, so um, I think for me it all started when I was doing my my own postdoc. I finished my PhD um, and I was at the Silicon Valley lab in uh, uh, of Microsoft Research. Um, as postdocs often do, uh, I was looking for an interesting new topic. It was 2011, so Bitcoin already existed, but I think almost nobody heard about it at the time. Um, and a friend sent me like um, a newspaper clipping. Uh, Bitcoin got into the news because it got to thirty dollars a, a coin, and uh, I thought it was really interesting because I was uh, really interested in protocols and e- economics and how they uh, intertwine. So I went to read about it, and I ended up writing a paper um, with other people in Microsoft Research at the time, which was uh, apparently one of the first uh, academic papers on Bitcoin. Not the first one, but uh, very early on. We, I, I remember our mentality at the time, you know, Bitcoin was, uh, the, the, the first bubble maybe was crashing and, and we thought we had to get our paper out as, as quickly as we could before this <laughs> thing vanishes. Um, so uh, basically that was, uh, that was our driving motivation. And uh, I think after a while I, I joined the Hebrew University, I started working with Yonatan and we delved much more deeply into cryptocurrencies. And wh- what about you, Yonatan? Well, um, my bachelor's degree was in mathematics in the Hebrew U. And then um, I went to computer science and uh, the first um, staff member I went to was Aviv Zohar. And he kind of told me about Bitcoin and I thought this was uh, too practical for me. It wasn't an interesting topic. And I said, you know what, I'll, I'll look for someone else. And then a few, a few months afterwards, I, I uh, discovered that, uh, I rediscovered Aviv's uh, uh, role and I went to him and we started working on it. And I think it accelerated uh, pretty fast of you, right? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think it was an early time for Bitcoin. There were a lot of very fundamental questions to ask at the time. And, and Jonathan, I'm, I'm very glad that, that after all, with what we're going to talk about today, uh, you guys did manage to find something very abstract and theoretical uh, and, and you managed to come away from, from doing work that's all too practical. Yeah, it's a, it's a very, it's, it's a, I feel lucky for, um, for this um, uh, marriage between theory and, and, and uh, practice. It doesn't happen in any other in, in fields that I, uh, I come up across uh, here. I mean, it's, we really work on theor- theoretical stuff, theoretical algorithms of even myself, and then we find them like very, very practical. So it's, I feel lucky for that. So most of this show is going to uh, focus on one of a, a, a new kind of cryptocurrency design that, uh, that Aviv and Yonatan have kind of pioneered. But before we started, uh, before we start going down that path, when I checked Aviv's uh, homepage, it lists his research interests as multi-agent systems and algorithmic game theory. Now, uh, now Aviv, like, can you tell us like what what these fields are and what 
what do they concern themselves with? Sure. Um, so multi-agent systems, if I was to des describe it very uh, briefly, is a subfield of artificial intelligence, really. Um, and in artificial intelligence, you want to understand how computational agents behave when they're doing things in a smart way. Multi-agent systems focuses on these systems that have a lot of agents that are behaving in some intelligent way. Um, and in that sense, you can think of, of uh, systems that are connected on the internet, right? If you, th you can think of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing um, as an agent running on your machine, he's managing things for you, he's downloading files, he chooses where to get them from and so on, and he acts on your behalf, he, he wants to do th in, uh, intelligent things. So multi-agent systems look, uh, is a field that looks at the uh, end result, the system that emerges. In that sense, I think Bitcoin could also be categorized as a multi-agent system. The, the term is very amorphic in some sense, um, where every miner might be doing clever things um, in, the, in, the, in, in uh, how it behaves, how it mines, which transactions it chooses, and so on. Um, and one of this, the tools that are used very often in this field uh, uh, is game theory. If you want to understand how somebody acts when he's intelligent, you can think of him as a rational actor, as a player. Um, so you can analyze the behavior of the system and maybe even design it. Um, and that's where algorithmic game theory fits in. Basically, if you want to talk about intelligent agents, you need to think about algorithms and game theory and how they are connected. Um, and so my research before Bitcoin has been about systems um, in general and thinking about protocols as game theoretic uh, interactions. So if you think about a protocol maybe that sends information over the internet, uh, you can think of it as a little bit of a game. It al the protocol allocates resources. Maybe it, it, we decide who gets the bandwidth and when. Um, and you might compete with others for bandwidth. So what, what happened if your computer tried to get more bandwidth out of the internet at the expense of others? Um, so does the protocol, uh, which sets the, the rules of the game, so to speak, uh, uh, induce good behavior when you think about players as being strategic? Um, so that is a natural foray, I think, into Bitcoin, where the protocol really pays people, right? And so game theoretic tools are very relevant to understanding how, how uh, nodes would behave, how uh, agents would work. So um, I hope that uh, covers it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think there's a, there's a lot of very interesting, uh, interesting overlap, and I'm sure this is going to get uh, even more relevant, right? When you think about like some sort of uh, computer agents doing all kinds of things, you know, in the future, when maybe some of the decision makers in the blockchain universe are going to be uh, AI and bots, and and uh, so it would be a, uh, should there be uh, these interactions are going to become even more relevant. Uh, yeah. So. I, I even think simple systems have interesting interactions. Like if you even think of, um, you know, miners that are connecting to minor mining pools, and they have a small agent that does something very silly. Just it chooses which mining pool to connect to based on the profits that they would expect. That already induces a very complicated system of behavior. It's nice to think about that, what that would do. What what are uh, the results? So uh, so this is everywhere I think in Bitcoin because incentives really matter in the protocol. So is, do you think, Aviv, that there's a link between um, like smart contracts as a technology and uh, the academic fields of multi-agent systems and algorithmic game theory? Because like smart contracts essentially give a way to like control and partition financial resources, right? And uh, is it the case that like smart contracts will become sort of the implementation layer for many ideas from, from your field? So definitely, we've seen many things come into cryptocurrencies that were um, that have grown within algorithmic game theory, within economics. Uh, we see things like uh, reputation systems, prediction markets. All of these things were heavily researched in computer science before uh, cryptocurrencies showed, showed up. They are implemented with smart contracts. Um, but, you know, more generally, smart contracts do everything that computers do, right? So it's, again, very natural to think about algorithms that move around money and to start to think of uh, how they would optimize, how they earn more, 
Um, so game theoretic tools are at the foundation of this. And even if you look at things underlying uh, the high level, uh, you know, the, the very low layer of Bitcoin has an economic or game theoretic argument for why Bitcoin is secure. We're paying people to mine, and so they're doing more of it, right? Um, so in some sense, even the foundation of Bitcoin relies on economic and game theoretic uh, concerns. Without it, there is no system. So you guys are well known for, for a few things, but one of them is something called a ghost, which uh, probably many uh, people have heard about in some context, uh, most, mostly in the Ethereum context. So ghost stands for greedy, heaviest observed subtree, which is a, a quite a mouthful. But uh, basically, it's a way to improve some of the game theory around proof of work. Can you run us through what Ghost is and, and how it works? Okay, so, so Ghost is um, a, a slight change to the, to, to the Bitcoin uh, rules, I guess, that we, we came up with when we were doing some analysis of what happens to Bitcoin when you try to scale it up. So one of the problems that when you try to scale Bitcoin up, either you increase the block size or you add more blocks per second, right? You decrease the block time from 10 minutes to something lower. You try to get more throughput, then um, you end up getting more and more orphan blocks. Um, so these are blocks that are created in parallel at the same time by two miners that have been trying to work. But because blocks propagate relatively slowly, if they're larger, for example, um, then they end up creating conflicting blocks more often than usual. Uh, if the, uh, and so Ghost was an attempt to try and still use the weight of a block um, and support the, the chain that's selected. So right, the Bitcoin usually takes the longest chain rule, throws away everything that's off the chain and just completely ignores it. Uh, instead, what Ghost would do, it would say, right, you're a block that is off the chain still supports in some way the weight of its uh, of the chain itself. Um, and the, this mouthful that you described, greedy heaviest subtree, is really just the description of the, pro of the algorithm, how it works. Um, um, you, can ch you can look at the a, at a block structure instead of a chain, it's actually a tree. Every, every block points to a predecessor. Uh, we may have many leaves. Um, and when we travel along the chain, we pick the chain by basically greedily selecting the, the, the child that has the heaviest subtree. Um, I guess you need to go into the paper a little bit more to see the details. But what we were hoping for, this was a very early attempt of ours to, to try to adjust the protocol to make it a bit more scalable. That if you can speed up the protocol uh, a little bit and still maintain the same level of security that you had before. Um, is that right? Maybe Jonathan wants to, to add something to what I just said. Well, it's, I, yeah, I agree with what you said, uh, more or less. It's, it's generally, uh, I would say it's not so much about the game theory, it's more about how to utilize uh, orphans to, uh, to enhance the security of the main chain. That's the main uh, benefit of Ghost. You have, you can, and you can scale, it, you have more scalability options because, because you use orphans to support the main chain. Yeah, so, so maybe just to explain this a little bit, because some people I think will not, not quite understand these relationships. So if, if we have, uh, in, in Bitcoin, right, we have a, a block every, every 10 minutes. So if, if a new block is created, it, it will take some time to reach, uh, to propagate the network. So, you know, maybe some miners in China only get it 30 seconds later. So in, in those 30 seconds, they would be mining on actually a block that's already outdated. So most likely if they find a block, it, it would basically be thrown away and, and, uh, and sort of the, the, the work or the mining hashing power would be wasted. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the, the, the more you go down with a block time, uh, the more this propagation time matters and the more uh, orphaned blocks occur and, and thus in a way, the more waste of, of work occurs. And so if, if you, but if you essentially kind of still count those orphan blocks uh, and, and they still contribute to the to security, then uh, maybe that's less of an issue and, and maybe you can do some of the things that, that now people are constantly saying, no, you can't do it uh, in the case of Bitcoin, right? One of the big arguments against uh, increasing the block sizes that people say 
uh, you know, it will it will favor bigger miners. It will create problems for miners that are not, aren't so well connected. It will slow the propagation of blocks, etc. So it's a uh, it is an interesting direction. Uh, yes, actually, I think you you, this, you mentioned uh, an important advantage of a Ghost when there's a network split. Then you know some miners um, uh, didn't hear about the current the updated chain and they mine on uh, on a fork. Then what you want to happen is that despite the conflict between these the chains of this these distant uh, factions and network, you want uh, all of this mining power to still support the the block uh, the last block that they they all agree on in the main chain, right? So you don't want the, all the work to get discarded. Uh, you're able to tolerate or um, temporarily tolerate, tolerate the fact that there's a decrease in the um, in the in the consensus uh, rate in the network, but you still want all blocks to work against um, to to enhance the security of, of previous blocks. That's the one main advantage of Ghost. So Ethereum Ethereum seems to do something similar, right? Where if um, there's a main chain. And let's say I create a block that wasn't included in the main chain. Even then, I can be be paid for creating what is called an uncle block, which is a block that is not on the main chain but is referenced by some other block in in the main chain. So how how is like Ghost different from what Ethereum did? Like did uh, did Ethereum implement all of it? So. Um... Ethereum came out and we were pleasantly surprised that they mentioned the ghost paper in their white paper. Uh, we kind of thought it was flattering. We didn't know Ethereum was coming and we actually didn't know that they had intended to, to implement. Um, but what we ended up uh, fi uh, finding out is that Ethereum doesn't uh, really implement Ghost uh, per se. What you what you're mentioning, uh, this payment to un to uncles, is something that could have uh, been interpreted as a different paper of, uh, of ours, uh, which was published at the same time as as Ghost. It's called the Inclusive Blockchains paper, which uh, in which we suggest that you pay uncles as well. Um, so Ethereum, what, what Ethereum doesn't do is it doesn't use the weight of the block, the proof of work that was invested uh, right into the into creating the block, to somehow add weight to a chain if if there is a fork for some reason that you need to decide between. Um, in that sense, Ethereum didn't add more security uh, by using a ghost. Um, so what what we should say is that uh, this uncle's only variant of of Ghost that Ethereum claimed to have is a very nice one. It's a, a Ghost itself, if it's used purely, has uh, some problems with it um, that maybe we won't go into. But uncle's only Ghost ha has a has a very good. Uh, um, uh, I think security benefits, and actually Rootstock, that kind of I guess competes with Ethereum, uh, did implement Ghost as, as we described it, or, uh, at least an Uncle's version uh, Ghost, uh, maybe with some additional modifications. Um, so it's definitely doable, but for some reason I don't know why Ethereum uh, chose not to. And just to just to clarify that, because so so if you say okay, a ghost adds you know the weight adds to the security of the chain, do you mean that let's say now we have uh, you know we have two blocks found around the same time at the same height, uh, do you then mean that let's say there are some additional blocks uh, found on on you know one side uh, that those then somehow contribute to that and you, and they somehow uh, make that the give like weight in a similar way that length matters with blockchains or, or can you explain that? So let me try to explain it um, abstractly, yes. So l let's suppose we have a, a split in the chain at some point. We have two different competing blocks at, at a certain height. Um, so what Ghost would do is it doesn't look at the length of the chain above each one of them. That's not what counts. The choice on which block will be accepted depends on the size of the entire subtree of blocks below one of them. So if the network is building blocks in some way that it, it does not build a long chain, they're doing a lot of they're building a lot of orphans, but they're still on top of one block, then that block would get a lot of weight despite the fact that the chain is not very long there. 
the attacker might be living on the other side of the fork, and he might be creating blocks using his, you know, a data center that's dedicated to it. And he might even be building them in, in a long chain, but as long as the compute power on, on the side of the network is, is greater, they don't have to be building blocks on top of each other to secure that block on the fork. Right? So somehow this fork gets really heavy weight as long as the entire network builds on top of it. Um, the, the risk that Ghost kind of has is that maybe we, we're going to have ties between the two systems. It breaks ties a little bit slower than, uh, than Bitcoin does. So if you use an uncle's only version of Ghost, so maybe it will take a little bit more time to resolve the fork, but once it is resolved, um, it's going to get overwhelming weight even if the block time is, is really fast. So even if the network is creating a lot of orphans, which we would have usually been thrown out in Bitcoin, we still get a lot of weight on that block. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, and I guess in the Bitcoin example, this wouldn't make much of a difference, but then it would make a difference if you, if you have a different kind of protocol that has much faster blocks and more orphans. Is, is that correct? Yeah, I guess what we're imagining is a world uh, sometime in the future where Bitcoin needs to process thousands of transactions per second and we really right. want larger blocks and faster block times. We don't want to wait 10 minutes at the supermarket to to get a confirmation. So, uh, you know, uh, the naive attempt to just increase the block size or to speed up blocks, which I personally prefer a bit more, would have gotten us into trouble with Bitcoin. Um, it, Ghost is still not a perfect solution. Uh, you know, the uncle's only version of Ghost gives you a little bit more security at the expense of a slightly slower time resolving forks. So you couldn't really scale up to, let's say, one second blocks. That would be too much. Um, but uh, the Ghost for us was just the first step in a progression of algorithms that kind of move in that direction. Bitcoin came with the blockchain, which is like the straight chain of blocks. And now you had, you had, you proposed Ghost in which uh, there's like, instead of a chain of blocks, there's like trees at, at each level, right? Like so one block can refer to, let's say two or three blocks in the, in, in, at the previous level and, and so on. And now your logical next paper is the Spectre paper, which is the main topic of, uh, for today. Uh, which I think in a sense like is, a, is an even general version of Ghost and maybe an even more scalable version of uh, of, uh, of of Bitcoin. So uh, please walk us through like what Spectre is and uh, what it seeks to do. Yeah, so I wouldn't uh, advertise Spectre as a generalization of Ghost. Um, although it does, uh, Ghost is an increment, incremental step towards Spectre. Uh, the main idea of Spectre is just to, um, to integrate any, every block that's created uh, into the ledger. So we don't want to discard and uh, get rid of uh, blocks because this will be a waste of the security, a waste of the throughput. You, want, re you really want uh, in a healthy system that every block is integrated into the public ledger. Um, so this is uh, technically what uh, Spectre does. Every every it kind of grows a massive DAG. DAG is simply a, a graph, or a certain uh, family of graphs, but it's a graph containing all blocks. This is uh, how Spectre works. But the main agenda of Spectre is is to create a protocol um, where the protocol imposes no um, bottleneck on the um, on the throughput of the system. What, you, uh, what we want is that um, the protocol will be secure under any throughput, and the limitation on the throughput would be the network infrastructure, um, specifically uh, the nodes bandwidth, available bandwidth uh, for uh, operation. Uh, in today's systems, um, the, the bottleneck uh, on, on Bitcoin, as we spoke earlier, is, is the, the protocol security, not the network infrastructure. And the challenge that Spectre sets out to solve is to create a protocol whereby you can increase the throughput to any level uh, that the network can support. And, and the, under any such level, the, the protocol will remain secure. 
Yeah, I mean, maybe I just want to sort of throw in how, how, I, how I see this, uh, and this is not a very technical explanation, right? But in, in, in Bitcoin, right, we have, or in, in some of Ethereum, you have these kind of transactions getting like accumulated quite slowly, kind of sent around, and then everybody kind of stamps it. And, you know, kind of every 10 minutes, we can say like, okay, you know, we move one step forward, we move one step forward, we move one step forward. You have this very kind of slow and and uh, tedious process and then and of course you know every block builds on the other block right so you can't you can't just do something but it has to exactly rely on the previous block and if it doesn't it gets thrown away and then if, if you look at this uh, specter or some of the other projects going in this direction you have all kinds of blocks being created at the same time and very, very fast and, and with like no limits and, you know, transactions just go in and, and then somehow they all, you know, so it's not like there's one height and one block and then the next one, but they're like, uh, yeah, like this graph web form and somehow they keep connecting with each other and, and confirming. And then you have this seemingly this massive uh, speed up of, um, of transaction. And of course, the, the difficult thing is it's really completely different. So it's, it's very hard to, you know, for me as somebody not very familiar with it, it's very hard to think about, does this make sense? Does it work? What are some of the risks? What are some of the security flaws? It's, it's very hard to do that coming from Bitcoin. Right. So maybe I should uh, address that concern uh, carefully, right? Um, so in, in Bitcoin, we have a very nice security analysis that explains to us why the protocol works. Basically, Satoshi uh, didn't do it exactly in that form, but it later got formalized into a theorem that says, you know, we have certain assumptions about the network, uh, that uh, blocks can be sent around quickly, that nodes are connected, um, and then a transaction that's embedded somewhere in the blockchain um, becomes irreversible, becomes secure as more blocks are added, right? This is the basic claim in Bitcoin. Uh, in Spectre, what we do, we, 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 we have a formal model of, of the protocol, of how the network uh, works. And the assumption that we make is that if the protocol um, works in a connected network, pretty much like Bitcoin, um, and blocks are built by, uh, by a majority of honest uh, participants that have proof of, uh, right, the proof of work uh, is done by uh, by the honest nodes and they have more computational power than the attackers, then again, the same thing happens uh, as in Bitcoin. Uh, the probability that the transaction that was accepted uh, will ever be rejected for some reason, uh, that will change our mind, um, decreases very fast, exponentially fast in the system. So um, uh, maybe it's a good idea to start to talk about how Spectre is kind of built. What it really allows is to, uh, for every miner, instead of just to pick a, pre a single predecessor, just uh, by, uh, right in Bitcoin, uh, every miner creates a block. The block has a cryptographic hash of the pre preceding block. That's what makes up the blockchain, these, these links uh, pointing back in time somehow to previous blocks. In Spectre, we just allow every miner to write several blocks in its past. And you can think of these as um, blocks that were created in parallel that this miner is aware of. So we don't force you to just pick one. You just, you're supposed to tell us about every block that you've seen. Um, so this is just a slightly different data structure. Instead of building a chain, it builds this long thing that gr still grows uh, and merges uh, uh, together uh, splits that occur in, in the structure. Um, and the, the idea is that if we speed up the protocol, we, we're going to have a lot of blocks built in parallel, so we're going to have to do a lot of these merges together. Um, and then what's really important, the real magic, is to somehow end up with a consistent set of transactions. Uh, you can think of it as a UTXO set in Bitcoin, that we, we've agreed that th these are the transactions that have occurred in the protocol. So just like in Bitcoin, every node that creates a block sends it to everybody else. So we have pretty much the same view of this data structure. Um, if we get a block, we have a list of the preceding blocks, so we know what we're supposed to read and, and request from uh, other nodes. Um, and uh, the only difference, just like in Bitcoin, you may not have heard about the last couple of blocks, maybe, right, because before they propagate to all of the nodes. So in the DAG scenario, you, you know about most of the graph that everybody else has seen. You might not agree about... Um, a certain uh, last portion of it that was added. And then what the protocol tries to do is to 
take this data structure and apply a function to it that will basically give us what is the set of transactions that did happen. And the properties that we'd like to have is that um, maybe two main things that we want is first, that when you put in a transaction, it will get accepted at some point, hopefully very quickly. And the second thing is that once we accept it as, uh, as, as a valid transaction that's in uh, the data structure, then we never change our mind, right? If, we, if you got money, then there's never a decision that says you don't have it. Um, and, if, and, and these are basically the two things that construct a consensus protocol. Uh, we want to make a decision really fast and we want the decision to be irreversible, at least with high probability. Um, so this is again is the goal of Spectre. The end result, of course, is that people can write blocks together as quickly as they manage to. We can speed up block creation by, by making the proof of work less, less hard. Right? There's, if there's a parameter in Bitcoin that says 10 minutes, you need to create a block pretty much every 10 minutes. We can go for one second blocks, which sounds outrageous. You're going to have a lot of orphans, but they all get merged together anyway, and we're still going to output a consistent set of transactions. Okay, that's the magic. Let's take a short break to talk about the iPrice, a competition being run by the Energy Innovation Hub. The iPrice is all about the machine economy, the rapidly evolving relationship between humans and machines, with huge technological revolutions coming like blockchain and artificial intelligence. Some crazy changes and new developments are ahead of us like autonomous driving, self-organizing supply chains, DNA replicating robots, and so much more. If you're doing work around these areas, the iPrize is your chance to do like Elon Musk and take it to the next level. It's a competition that's being run until July 28th. Startups can apply in three different categories and have a chance to win up to 250,000 euros in seed funding. Even if you just have an idea, you can apply as an individual and get a stipend, office basement in Berlin, and mentorship to grow your idea. So whether you're just mulling over a world-changing idea in your basement, have built your first prototype, or founded your company, you can participate and make it to the great finale in Berlin on September 28th. So go to epicenter.tv slash iPRIZE, that's I-P-R-I-Z-E, to learn more about the competition and how you can apply. We'd like to thank Energy and the iPRIZE for their support of Epicenter. So maybe, maybe I can like sort of create a sort of imagination for for Spectre and please tell me if, if it makes sense. So, so let's imagine that like the four of us, uh, we are all miners, right? And there's not just the four of us, but there's like Sebastian, there's William, there's other people around the world that are also miners, right? And all of us are basically connected using a peer-to-peer -peer gossip network of, of some kind, similar to, very similar to Bitcoin. Now, in, in Bitcoin, what would happen is like every 10 minutes, like all of us are trying to solve these puzzles. And let's say Brian ends up solving the puzzle like he's the winning miner. And like in Bitcoin, he would create a block. And then 10 minutes later, there would be some other winning miner and they, they would create another block. And, and so it, it builds on block by block and it makes a chain. But in Inspector, it's like all of us are trying to solve the puzzles. And it is very much possible and very much expected uh, the block time is like one second so right this second it is very much expected let, that let's say three of us create blocks so brian creates a block yunathan creates a block and meher creates a block and we broadcast all of these three blocks through the gossip network to others now that was this time instant let's say one second later the next time instance um aviv creates a block and just aviv creates a block but then aviv can refer to the blocks of Brian, Yunatan, and Meher. So he can. So Aviv's block can have like three parents. All all of these three blocks can be the parent. And then the the instant thereafter, t plus two seconds, seven miners around the world, who are not us but some other seven miners, they create blocks. And it could be the case that some of the like two of two of these miners included all of our blocks as parents. And the rest of the five, they maybe just included Yunatan's block as a, as, a, as a parent. And so, like, miners keep building these blocks and they refer to each other as parents. And, like, you get this sort of data structure that is not a chain, but this thing which is called a directed acyclic graph. 
and all of the nodes and all of the miners have let's say substantially the same data structure and from this data structure each node computes somehow the set of valid unspent transaction outputs and as long as all of these nodes uh, have the same view on what constitutes the set of valid uns unspent transaction outputs uh, the currency works yeah that's a that's a great explanation i think yeah definitely so uh the the real trick here is deciding really what would happen right the the risk here is if if let's say uh you and Jonathan right Mayor and Jonathan create blocks in parallel there's always a risk that somebody put in a conflicting transaction in these two blocks right uh Mayor was supposed to pay Brian uh money but he also paid uh, me money the same money at the same time Right, and we can't have money going to two different people. One of these transactions ended up in Mayor's block, one was in Jonathan's block, um, and then later maybe a, a block was created referring to the two of them. We cannot accept both of them. We need to output a set that says only one of them is, is there and the other is rejected. Um, and we need to do it in a way that everyone agrees. Right? That's the basic consensus problem. Um, so, so maybe the, the I most interesting thing to notice first is that the DAG structure that we, we built instead of a chain still has the, the, the original chain inside it, right? If, if you would ask just every miner to just point at a single block, obviously he would point to one of the blocks that he heard of. Um, when you have a list of them, that one is included as well, right? So if you really wanted to use the DAG to just reconstruct the longest chain protocol, you could have done it. You just, you know, the DAG also has a chain inside it. And the longest chain in the DAG is also the longest chain that would be created if we were just running the Bitcoin protocol and not keeping a lot of links. So in some sense, this data structure just tells us more. You, we ask the miner, tell us about more blocks that you've seen, not just the longest chain. Tell us about everything. And then we, we later come in with the algorithm. We could have picked the longest chain, but the algorithm does fancier stuff and integrates uh, the blocks together somehow and gets us a transaction set that builds upon all of the blocks instead of just the longest chain, right? So that was the challenge. Um, and uh, uh, the protocol itself, Spectre, is uh, a little bit complex even uh, to just decide what are the blocks, but, but I think we can walk through a few steps to get there. Um, so maybe the first step to understand is that it's it's nice to have some relation on the blocks uh, in the sense that if I have a block that defeats another block or precedes another block, I can use that to determine whether the transactions of uh, when when I see two conflicting transactions in these two blocks, if block A defeats block B in some sense, which we we need to decide what you know how we how do we decide if a block defeats another but once we've made that decision and we have two conflicting transactions in block a and block b we can say the one in block a wins and is accepted and the one in block b loses and is rejected right so the entire problem of um deciding which transactions made it into the ledger eventually comes down to deciding which block defeats the other block in some sense in a kind of a pairwise uh, relation. Um, and then what Spectre does is also something that um, somehow is uh, intuitively embedded in Bitcoin itself, in the Bitcoin protocol. It basically takes a vote, right? It, um, um, when we have two blocks, we need to decide if block A defeats block B or block B defeats block A. So we basically take a vote. We say who is in favor of block A, who is in favor of block B. And we take the majority's decision. Right? So what is the vote? Who votes here? Basically, every other block in the DAG, we consider them a voter. Right? So uh, when you created a block, um, you basically voted about every single block uh, that came before you and that will even come after you. You say, do I think that this block defeats another block, yes or no? Right, so Spectre is somehow, you can think of it as a voting algorithm in some sense that decides if block A defeats block B or vice versa. Um, so uh, why do I say that this happens in Bitcoin? You can think about the longest chain rule in Bitcoin, right? If there is a fork in Bitcoin's chain, 
the longest chain is chosen and the miner will build a block on top of the longest chain. One way to think about it is this is a vote, right? So a miner looks at two of the chains. He says, I prefer this one to that one. So he invests mining efforts and dedicates it to the longer chain. That basically makes that chain a little bit longer. That's like adding a vote to that uh, specific option. Right, so our intuition to think about Spectre in terms of voting actually came from kind of understanding how Bitcoin works. And you can also think of the ghost protocol that we mentioned before as a voting protocol, basically saying which way should I go, which block should I support, this one or that one. Um, so that is maybe another step towards understanding a little bit about how Spectre works. When you read the Bitcoin white paper, um, Satoshi I think the genius of Satoshi was like sort of at one of the geniuses of Satoshi was to just identify that like double spending is sort of the fundamental problem that needs to be solved. Right. And in the Bitcoin protocol, uh, we can think of it like the Bitcoin protocol uh, enforces purity against double spends right at the, at the data structure level. So in the, in the Bitcoin protocol, there is this one data structure, the blockchain. And the Bitcoin blockchain doesn't have two conflicting transactions. Like it's pure in the sense that there is, there's never going to be two conflicting transactions in the Bitcoin blockchain, as long as the protocol is working well. Now with Spectre, you're sort of relaxing that assumption that the purity doesn't need to be in the data structure. The data structure itself can have conflicting transactions. And like the data structure is being built as quickly as as the network can, and it can have conflicting transactions. But once the, the data structure is built, each node has a way of filtering out. So whenever there are two conflicting transactions, each node has a way of filtering out one and keeping the other. And like as long as, so, so there's this method of filtering out, right? So you get a data structure and there's a method of filtering out the transactions that we want to reject, like that they are double spends and we want to filter them out. And as long as my way of filtering out these transactions is the same as Brian's, is the same as Aviv's, is the same as Jonathan's, is the same as Matthew's around the world. As long as our way of filtering the, out these transactions is the same, will be in consensus and the currency system will keep working. Right. So it's like it's you're removing the um, the role of identifying double spends and removing them from consideration to sort of this this higher level, uh, which is like a computation that each node is doing rather than in the data structure itself. Yes, we, we can actually do a thought experiment. What would happen if you let miners put conflicting transactions into the Bitcoin blockchain, right? So I would claim that it would still not hurt the protocol. So think of having a long chain and you have two conflicting transactions in there in different blocks. So one of them came before the other. Um, what you could do is if you read the blockchain from start to finish, you could say, okay, this transaction came first. This one should have been thrown out, so I'll throw it out. I will filter it exactly the, uh, the same way that you, you just mentioned. So uh, Bitcoin basically says, okay, since we're going to filter it anyway, we might as well not write it in the blockchain to begin with, just save the space and, and avoid the trouble. Um, so in some sense, what uh, if you, we understand the core functionality of Bitcoin as just giving order over the transactions. And if we have order, we can filter them the, exactly the same way. And then Bitcoin says, okay, let's just not write them in, which is a, you know, as a matter of uh, fact, uh, very simple. But in, uh, when you have block DAGs, you are expecting to have a lot of blocks that were built at the same time by honest participants. They didn't see each other's blocks. So it, w it wasn't a malicious thing. Maybe sometimes they include the same transaction twice. Maybe they include different ones that are conflicting. Um, so you say, okay, they didn't do it on purpose. Let's just filter out the transactions in some way. Um, so that, that, the, that realization basically says, okay, what we need is, um, you know, ideally we'd like to have an order over transactions. That would be the, you know, a very powerful thing. But Spectre doesn't exactly give you an order. It gives something slightly different. Transactions um, in different blocks might defeat each other. Block A might defeat block B. 
but it isn't in order uh, because block A might defeat block B, which might defeat block C, which might in turn defeat block A. So we might have circles in there. And that's a peculiarity of Spectre. Um, but it still doesn't prevent us from outputting a, a consistent transaction set. Uh, it still works. Right? It's a little bit nuanced to, to exactly understand how, but, uh, but the protocol still works uh, in that sense. So, I mean, it sounds pretty amazing, right? If you can, if you can do this thing and if, if one is able to produce blocks at such a, an incredible rate and, and, and not uh, lose uh, security and uh, also have this, this great scalability. So I'm, I'm curious, what are the, the places where this design is, is a disadvantage? Why would one build, uh, you know, something like Bitcoin you know, if this had been known to Satoshi in 2008, should he have done for that? Or is, would there still be some benefits to something like Bitcoin? So I, I think the main problem with Spectre, if we want to put it right up front, is that it's very complicated, right? It's very hard to understand. It's also very hard to code because of that. So this is a problem with the protocol uh, and we're working on nicer versions uh, that should be, I, I think, more understandable, more clear to people. Um, that's maybe a, a very big problem. The second thing is, about, is maybe nuanced, a little bit nuanced. If you have a protocol that provides an order over the transactions like Bitcoin, for example, um, you can apply smart contracts, for example. You can run Ethereum on a sim similar blockchain. And Ethereum really, for Ethereum, it really matters uh, if you think about it, the transactions in Ethereum are really inputs to algorithms. And when you run an algorithm and you put one input before the other, it changes the, uh, the result if you would switch them in the order, right? So Ethereum is very... Um, maybe sensitive to the order of transactions in its uh, blockchain. Um, Bitcoin is usually not sensitive to the order of transactions. For example, if I was paying Jonathan and Brian was paying Mayer at the same time, we didn't ma it do doesn't matter if you wrote your transaction first or I wrote my transaction first, um, we'd still both get paid, right? Order only matters in Bitcoin when, we are, when I am paying two people with the same money. When I'm double spending. So usually I don't need to decide about the order exactly. So what Spectre does is it leverages that exactly as a property, right? If I, if I can use money and most of the time order doesn't matter, then maybe I don't need to decide the order. Sometimes it's okay to have these circular uh, s scenarios. Um, and the problem in manifests itself in Spectre when I do a double spend. Okay, so if I do a double spend, Spectre isn't going to be, sometimes, I should, I should maybe qualify this, if the network is under attack at the same time by some powerful miner, then maybe the double spends wouldn't get ordered. We wouldn't know if block A defeats block B or if block B defeats block A. Um, so this sounds like a really bad thing, but honestly, it's not, not so bad, why? because the person who's receiving money from me that I'm trying to dupe by double spending sees both of these transactions. Okay, they weren't, with, they weren't withheld. It's not that he sees only one transaction, he thinks he has money. He really sees two of them. One that I pay uh, Jonathan, one that I pay Mayer, for example. And he says, okay, these, the, these transactions have just not been accepted yet. We didn't decide which one came first. So we're delaying decision. He's, basically, he looks at his phone or his app and he says, okay, there's a pending payment, but this payment is still not accepted, it's still pending. So th if we wait a long time and the network is really under attack during this whole time, this payment is still not processed. So I cannot accept this as a payment that I've received. Um, if you're buying at my store, I'm not going to give you uh, the product that you're buying. Um, so, so this mechanism, if you think about it, really just punishes the people who double spend. On the other hand, if you're a regular participant, you just use Bitcoin, you just send it to somebody you, you, and you don't double spend, um, then there's no problem. Uh, your transaction gets confirmed really, really fast. Spectre can really go to uh, block rates that are maybe one second for a megabyte block, you know, as long as you can handle the bandwidth. Um, and then your transaction gets accepted within seconds. Uh, we have, we're making an assumption here that we can propagate a megabyte block 
to all of the miners in maybe a second. But this is what really happens uh, today, even in the Bitcoin network. There's a the very fast relay network and fiber uh, and so on that allow miners to connect to each other and have this infrastructure to relay blocks. And even without it, block propagation time was uh, pretty fast um, uh, in the internet. Uh, after all, a megabyte is not a very large uh, portion to send. So what happens is that the protocol, usually if you're a good player, gives you money quickly. If you're double spending, it might delay the transaction, but it doesn't hurt the person who's receiving the payment. And uh, tying that back into smart contracts, right? Spectre is not as good if you wanted to run Ethereum on top of it, because if two people were interacting in a contract with Ethereum, then order matters here. It's like inputs to, a pro to, a, to an algorithm, and it's important if one of them speaks first or the other. Right? And th that, of course, depends on the algorithm. Like, right? If you're running some voting contract or, over Ethereum, and I vote first, and then you vote, and, and we, 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 we switch the order, then the outcome of a vote doesn't change if we switch the order. So maybe this kind of contract would work. But if a contract pays somebody money based on how fast he got there, if he was first or second, then, of course, order matters. Um, so that's maybe the weakness of, of Spectre. It took a step back to allow less strict rules instead of giving order over transactions. But it gains a lot in terms of, s of scale and speed of uh, confirming transactions. Let me just clarify one thing, um, following this, this um, description. We do, we, the assumption that uh, uh, one megabyte of a block propagates in one second is not, the security of the protocol is not contingent on this fact. So. Um, a user that observes the network and sees that uh, in, in the current network conditions, it, took, it takes a, a block of one megabyte uh, 10 seconds to, to propagate, will merely just wait uh, additional time. So it doesn't need to update all other nodes that the propagation delay is faster. It, that this, this parameter is not hard-coded in, uh, in the Spectre protocol. And that's the main separation Meher uh, perhaps referred to, that the consensus is run locally in each node's the ordering of the, of the DAG or the almost ordering of the DAG is run locally in ev at every node. And the only thing that miners do is just mine blocks and tell us about all previous blocks that they saw. So this is important because, again, if, if one megabyte, you, you don't put uh, embed this assumption inside the protocol. This is a crucial point. So that's, that's super interesting. Like It's like with Bitcoin as, as the underlying, so there's an underlying peer-to-peer -peer gossip network inside Bitcoin, right? And the gossip network can improve and does improve over time that blocks get sent between miners very quickly. But that really doesn't translate into a performance advantage for the Bitcoin network as a whole. So so today, let's assume, let's assume somebody figures out a way to propagate blocks from China to Iceland twice as quickly. And that upgrade happens. Bitcoin's block time will still be 10 minutes. It will still do a one megabyte block number of transactions per second will be the same, right? But effectively what's sort of happening here is like, as the speed of the network increases, you can shrink the block block time even further without uh, without there needing to be some external coordination. Is, is, is that you, what, what you mean? I'm not sure, so let me, let me make uh, this uh, clear. There is, um, the protocol does, um, readjust its difficulty and does um, aim at a constant block creation rate and we can add at a constant uh, upper bound on block size. So we can say, for instance, uh, it will be hard coded that we're aiming at one megabyte per second or, or uh, one block per second of one megabyte, etc. This will be um, hard, uh, hard coded in the um, difficult, uh, uh, block, block creation difficulty adjustment protocol, but the, the users, when they confirm transactions, so let's say I'm a merchant at some uh, point of sale, and I observe the network. So when I observe the network, the time it will take me to confirm transactions will depend on the network conditions that I see. So if I see that the network is healthy now, and it propagates one megabyte within one second, then I will confirm a, a Spectre transaction within seconds. However, if I will see that there's some hiccups in the network, and it takes five seconds or five minutes for blocks, to propagate and for data to propagate inside the network, 
then I will readjust my acceptance policy and I will wait further. So there, there is indeed there's no need for coordination when, uh, in the usual level when they confirm transactions and they will indeed enjoy fast confirmation time when that network is healthy, is healthy and the slow confirmation time when it's not. Okay, but uh, in contrast to that, there is a, a parameter in the protocol that says how many blocks and what size of blocks we create per second. Okay, understood, understood. So, uh, so t give us an idea about like what kind of scalability benefits does can this? So, this is a pure payment play, right? This this cannot be a smart contract cryptocurrency. This has to be like a like a pure payments cryptocurrency that's. Uh, that's super fast to confirm. Like I send a transaction, it confirms very quickly. And all around the world, we can do many more transactions because like blocks can be created in parallel and they can be created much more quickly. So the advantages seem to stem from creating blocks in parallel and creating them very quickly. But the disadvantage appears to be that smart contracts are, are not on the table at least today. So can you quantify the... Um, the speed and scalability advantages, like give us an order of magnitude estimate of what they could be? Well, the order of magnitude depends on your assumptions on the network, right? Because Spectre is not a barrier to, to scalability, then my answer depends really on the, on the network. What do you assume on the network? So let me get into numbers. Let's assume nodes are able to support bandwidth wise, they're able to support one megabyte per second. Then we can create uh, 10 blocks of uh, 100 kilobytes per second, or one block of uh, one megabyte per second, or you know, two, one, one block every 10 seconds with uh, uh, 10 megabytes. We can, we can use all these variations, uh, and Spectre will remain secure. So again, the, 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 the bottleneck is the network infrastructure, not, the, the, not Spectre. So it's more kind of a, a network question. Now, there are problems that, that come up when you want to scale to 1,000 transactions per second. Um, for instance, node storage, right? So in, in, at a certain level, you don't want nodes to be uh, forced to store too, too much transactions. But these are network level um, constraints. And yes, we, we, we want to solve them directly, but Spectre is not, it's not part of the, the game. Spectre is secure anyways. If you assume that, these, that there was like a putative Spectre network that performed, that had network conditions similar to Bitcoin, when Bitcoin is not under attack, like like the normal Bitcoin network today, um, like similar number of nodes, similar number of mining nodes, and in a sense, like you are using the network bandwidth more efficiently in order to make the network go faster using this design, right? So could you give us some numbers there? Like what would be the scalability advantage there? Well, I guess in today's Bitcoin network conditions, you can, you can assume that uh, nodes have one megabyte per second um, available to them. Um, I, I think storage will become a problem in today's conditions because you do the assumption, you do the calculation, I think it's around 86, 86 gigabyte per day if, if, you, if you do one megabyte per second, if I'm not mistaken. And, but that will, that, will, that will go in the order of, of 2,000 or more transactions per second. Um, admittedly, some nodes won't uh, will be uh, pushed out of the pushed out of the game because they can't support one megabyte per second of bandwidth or or storage. So there is a trade off here because once you 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 stretch the system to its limits, then some nodes become out of the game are pushed out of the game. So I would say one megabyte uh, in today's Bitcoin network condition is a bit um, too high. I think I would go initially for, um, I th I'd say 100 kilobyte, um, yeah, 100 kilobyte per second, I guess. Maybe Abib has a different opinion. Yeah, what, I, what I'd like to say is, I, you know, I think you, you just need to accept that if you want a very large ledger, it's going to take a lot of storage, right? So obviously there's, there's no free lunch here. Uh, but having said that, even Bitcoin's current infrastructure supports not holding the entire blockchain in, 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 your, in your node. Right. You could have special nodes that hold uh, everything, but it's okay if you just hold the last couple of days worth of data 
Um, so if somebody connects you, they can sync. Um, so maybe Jonathan said one megabyte per minute uh, per second. You might need a bit more because you you might be sending copies of the blockchain to several of your peers in the gossip network. But but honestly, with what is currently a home internet connection, uh, I think you can get a few megabytes per second. It's very easy. Um, maybe the the most important point is that what what Spectre removes is it removes the problem of block propagation time, right? So we can go up to the bandwidth level. You, you need to decide whether you want to do it, right? So ju just just maybe to put things into context, right? Maybe the um, uh, yeah, the viewers uh, aren't aware or the list, right? Bitcoin uh, does currently create a, a single megabyte block approximately every 10 minutes. That translates to three transactions per second. If you go to a, a megabyte per second, Right, a megabyte uh, in Bitcoin's terms can hold roughly 2,000 transactions. If you look at blocks today, that means 2,000 transactions per second instead of three or four. That's three orders of magnitude. Right, so there, are, of course, there are going to be a lot of engineering challenges in between there. Uh, you know, scaling up. Bitcoin currently holds the entire UTXO set in memory. Maybe you know, when you scale up this large, uh, it will be hard. But but these are not problems with the consensus protocol. It pushes right. So Spectre basically pushes all these problems again back into the engineering that we know how to handle. Right, a node can can buy a lot of storage. Right, if you think about prices of, of storage, how many how much does it cost to buy a terabyte or two every year? Not uh, not a lot of money. So even if you think about a megabyte per second, you scale it up to a year. So I, I, I happen to disagree with Jonathan. I don't think it's a lot of storage, uh, given that prices of storage are uh, declining all the time. And we're not talking about Bitcoin today, right? Bitcoin is not going to have 3,000 or 2,000 transactions per second today. It's going to take years to get there. Um, and it's going to take an engineering effort uh, to do so. So what we'd really love to have is on-chain scalability, which is really massive. Um, and uh, while Spectre really doesn't do well with with smart uh, contracts and so on, there's no reason why on the same blockchain, uh, right, or on the same block DAG, you couldn't have a smart contract system running in parallel inside the blocks and using something like the longest chain to, to decide on its order. Uh, it wouldn't be as fast. Smart contracts would still be slow, maybe on this order of 10 minutes or so. But it, they could live in the same structure, right? Because we could just pick the longest chain. So we could build hybrid systems. It's possible. It's not very difficult to imagine how they are. Um, so I think in that sense, what we'd like to do is, is, is Spectre kind of gives us this ability to do payments really fast. Um, I think we should grab that opportunity. Wow. Yeah, this certainly uh, sounds like an amazing, uh, amazing technology and some amazing things uh, happening there. Now, th there are currently some projects in the cryptocurrency space that are doing work in this direction. Uh, probably the best known of them is, is a project called Yota, um, which is using this uh, DAX as well. Could you guys comment on, on what they are doing and, and how you think it compares to Spectre? So I think it's a little bit hard to uh, give a, a good opinion of IOTA. Um, we've looked at the white paper that they wrote. Um, they, they have some uh, interesting ideas for the protocol. Um, but one thing that is missing for us to fully evaluate the paper is uh, we're, we're, we're academics, so we're used to a very high level of formalism. Basically, theorems where you state your assumptions, um, you prove that you get certain properties from the protocol. Right? So if you, if you were to go to look at uh, Spectre, uh, we, we took our 90-page paper basically to, to very carefully state what the properties of the protocol, what the assumptions are on the network, and then it's it's easier for us to understand if you know either the assumptions are wrong or the proof is wrong. But if you accept the assumptions and the proof, then the the end result has to be true. IOTA gives the, a protocol; it doesn't uh, do so very formally, so it's very hard to analyze. Uh, the white paper is also 
I guess, kind of old, so I'm not really sure what's implemented in code versus what's in the white paper. Um, so we had concerns about, I guess, the white paper, but it, it could be just that we're misreading what the protocol does because it's not stated formally enough for us. Um, I guess other uh, works in uh, other papers uh, in the area sometimes, uh, I think, have the same problem uh, for us. Cool. Thanks. That that's very helpful. Now, now before Jonathan, you mentioned that uh, you guys are also working on on a foundation to to work uh, on this technology. Can you share a bit about that? Sure. So um, I'm founding now a new uh, initiative, the Paragon Foundation. It's a nonprofit uh, research and development foundation uh, dedicated to uh, dedicated to implement Spectre and the follow up protocols. Um, so we, we intend to develop the protocol up to testnet level um, and um, uh, do simulations and, and uh, show its, uh, its, improve, its uh, performance. And then we hope that uh, teams will come um, to the, that will join us and uh, collaborate and take these, take these uh, pro uh, protocols and implement them and commercialize them. So all of our, our development will be up open source and we really are excited to uh, to found this, and it's really now uh, initializing in these days. And you should also mention that you guys are not doing a crowdfunding campaign, uh, because this is certainly what most people would do with, with this kind of uh, proposal. Or Yes, so um, the, the ICO market is today a bit crazy, and um, so it's, that's one reason not to go directly down this path. Um, but another more important consideration is that our intention is to um, to be a, a research and development project that's more dedicated to blockchain technology in general and not to a specific uh, protocol and commercial product. So if you you know if you develop one product, then you will um, you will defend its merits uh, at all costs, and you will try to push this uh, specific product and say you know this is this is the best solution out there and. Um, and I hope you, you're convinced now that we are more upfront uh, about the merits and the uh, drawbacks of Spectre. So Spectre is just the first milestone of uh, the Paragon Foundation's uh, roadmap, but we're, we intend to, to um, utilize, uh, implement and uh, deploy up to technical level any, um, any uh, research uh, that's um, um, out there in, uh, in the open source, in the public domain. That's the main long, uh, long run goal. Okay, well, thanks so much, uh, Jonathan uh, and Avi, for coming on. It was a super interesting to talk about that. And I think this is, uh, well, we can't wait to do more episodes on this and hopefully also see some, you know, Spectre getting getting to an implementation, getting a testnet and all of those. I think that would be very extremely interesting. So for our listeners, we, we had like lots more to cover, right? Like... Uh... We had like lots of topics we wanted to cover, like how would Spectre behave against network partitions, how would hard folks work and like things like that. But I think we're just out of time. So maybe we'll have you back again, Aviv and Yonatan, and discuss some more when you have an, an alpha test net running. Yeah, that'll be great. Uh, thanks guys for having us. We know it's a very complicated protocol. Uh, people who wanna learn a little bit more about it, uh, can go to a Medium post that uh, we wrote. Uh, it tries to lay out the protocol and the different things that it does. Maybe it'll do a better job explaining. There are some um, nice illustrations that I hope will help people understand. Um, and if anybody is interested in implementing besides the Paragon Foundation, we've heard from a, a few groups that are interested in the protocol. We're always happy to collaborate and help. Uh, we're going to just... Uh, uh, we love to see our work out there. Uh, we're not trying to commercialize anything ourselves. No, nothing is patented. Everything is free for everyone to use. And we're very sympathetic to people who want to do, uh, you know, who want to use our work. I think it's the greatest thing an academic uh, group can have, right? An impact on the world. Yeah, absolutely. So, of course, we're going to be l linking uh, to the Medium post that uh, we've mentioned and, you know, some of the academic articles we talked about and the website and all of that in the show notes. So if you want to go deeper, you can check that out. 
And uh, yes, thanks so much for our listeners once again tuning in. So uh, we are part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin Network. You can find this show and other shows on Let's Talk Bitcoin.com. Uh, and if you want to support the show, you can leave an iTunes review for us. that helps new people uh, find the show. And uh, thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week.